Hello and welcome back to another video. Today we're going to explore the second extension of the simply typed lambda calculus, the system lambda weak omega. In the last two chapters we introduced simple types into the lambda calculus and we added polymorphic types on top. This gave us the following dependencies. In the simply typed lambda calculus we used term abstraction in terms to form more complex terms. Therefore we had terms depending on terms. In the lambda 2, we added to this terms depending on terms, type abstraction in terms to construct terms with polymorphic types. This is called terms depending on types. Now for the new system, we're going to once more extend the simply typed lambda calculus. So we keep terms depending on terms and we add a new kind of dependency, types depending on types. So we're going to add type abstraction in types. This system is denoted by a lambda with an underlined Greek W and it's called lambda weak omega. The attribute weak is used to differentiate it from a closely related system called lambda omega, which we're going to take a look at towards the end of this video. Extending the simply typed calculus with types depending on types doesn't create more computational power, so we can't encode more function in this calculus, but it makes writing more complex types easier and it restructures the way we create types in general. Well then, First, we want to recap the already known dependencies before we analyze what this new dependency is and how we can abstract something in a type. In the term term dependency, we start with a term x of type alpha. Now, what we can do is introduce an abstraction that abstracts the x from something, so lambda x of type alpha dot x. And this abstraction has the type alpha to alpha. Therefore, the term lambda x of type alpha dot x depends on the term x because we can't know the actual value of the whole term until we put a concrete instance for x. If we take that term and apply it to something of type alpha, say a variable y, we can do a better reduction which yields y, which is again of type alpha. If we would apply the term to a term z instead of y, we would get a different result, z. In conclusion, the actual value of the application depends on the term x in the abstraction. A term depending on a type means something only slightly different. Once again, we have a term x of type alpha, but this time we add an abstraction over the type, so that lambda x of type alpha dot x could be generalized to lambda type alpha dot lambda x of type alpha dot x. With this, the term is not restricted to a specific type, but it is able to use any type in place of alpha. This term, however, cannot be definitively evaluated until we apply it to a fixed type like sigma. So this term now depends on a type, because we need to give it a concrete type before we can work with it. And again, we have better reduction, which would give us the term lambda x of type sigma dot x. Obviously, these two terms still depend on the term x too. This term term dependency can never be abandoned, as we would lose every term abstraction and application when doing so. Drawing from these terms depending on terms and terms depending on types, you might already have an idea about how types depending on types could work. A term depending on a term is a term whose end result changes according to an input term. So we constructed terms with the help of other terms. A type depending on a type is a type whose end result changes according to an input type. So now we're going to construct types with the help of input types. Take a look at alpha to alpha. It would be natural to define a function which takes any type alpha as an input and then returns alpha to alpha. With type abstraction, this would be lambda type alpha dot alpha to alpha. So we have a type alpha to alpha that changes depending on the input type. It could reduce to sigma to sigma when we apply it to sigma or to gamma to gamma or even more complex terms. One can imagine this as fixing the structure of a type that one would like to have. Another feature of this dependency is that we're going to generate types by ourselves instead of getting them from the system. We've already done so in lambda 2. In the simply type calculus, we're given type variables in a set of types, and for every two types we could combine them with an arrow. So we could write alpha is in t, and alpha to alpha is in t2. Now we're going to use the same symbol as in the polymorphic lambda calculus, star, which tells us that a type is indeed a type, and we're going to add this information to the context or in type abstractions. So now we have alpha of type star and alpha to alpha of type star. But what would be the type of this type abstraction? 
lambda type alpha dot alpha to alpha. It takes a type and it returns a type. So we could denote this as star to star, since we get something of type star and we return something of type star. To avoid overuse of a name, a type of a type is not actually called a type. It's called a kind. So we say that this term, which takes a type and returns a type, is of kind star to star. Kinds are always a combination of stars and arrows. They all represent type abstractions. The single star could be seen as a constant function, if you will. It's the kind of every type. The other kinds get a type or a type abstraction as an input, and they either return a type or another type abstraction. So, in conclusion, kinds are the types of types. They say something about the structure of type abstraction. We can define kinds properly and recursively, like we did in our formal definition of types, like so. But for this construct, we're going to take a more figurative approach using grammar notation known from theory like formal language. The single star is a kind by itself. It's inhabited by every type. If we have two kinds, we can combine them by an arrow, and this is inhabited by a type abstraction with the first kind as an input and the second as an output. With these kinds, we can express the structure of a type abstraction just like we were able to express the input-output structure of term abstraction with types. So, looking back at the type abstractions, they kind of look like lambda terms, but that's not quite the case. They're missing the essential property of being a term that can be better reduced to a new term. They construct a type, and so we're going to fittingly call them type constructors or constructors for short. Even types which have kind star and don't contain any abstractions are called constructors. So alpha on its own is a constructor, and so is lambda beta dot beta. To distinguish between types and type abstractions that actually do construct something, we're going to call the latter proper constructors. So constructors have a kind. With terms, constructors and kinds, we can build these chains. A term has a type which has a kind star and a proper constructor, which can't be inhabited by a term, can have a kind like star to star. But where do these kinds live? We'd like to give those kinds a type as well. We make things simple by giving them all the same type, which we denote by this box. So every kind is a box. These boxes will be needed to perform derivations later. In fact, this isn't so different from how we treated our types in the simply type lambda calculus, where we simply said that all types are of kind star. This time, all kinds are box. Now, to formalize these dependency chains, we call each position in such a chain a level. In the simply type lambda calculus and lambda 2, we only use the first two levels, that of terms and that of types or constructors. In lambda weak omega, two more levels formed, that of kinds and that of box. So on level 1 is always a term. The type of such a term lives on level 2, the same as all proper constructors. We normally have a colon between the levels to make this relationship explicit. Constructors like alpha to alpha have a kind like star, which will live on one level higher in level 3. And lastly, box is assigned to all kinds, so it's on its own level on level 4. Now, proper constructors will be put on level 2, the same as types, which are constant constructors, with one important difference. Proper constructors don't have inhabitants, so there can't be a term on level 1 with the proper constructor as its type. For this proper constructor, lambda beta dot beta, which is our identity function on types, we can't construct a term with that type, since it is not a type. But of course, this proper constructor has something on level 3 and 4. The identity function on types has kind star to star, since it takes a type and it returns a type, and that kind is of course a box. To make reasoning and talking about our system easier, we're going to refer to the two symbols star and box as sorts, and we're going to use the letter s. So if you see a lowercase s in the derivation rules later on, this means that s is either star or box. Again, we're mainly doing this to simplify the derivation rules. Nevertheless, this notion is also a preparation for the lambda cube, where we want a uniform definition for all systems, and we're going to need these sorts for that. Now that we have a new kind of abstraction and application, we also need better reduction and conversion. These notions are once again very intuitive and they work just like they did for lambda terms. 
Because of that, we're going to skip the formal definition and we're just going to go straight to an example. This term is a type depending on a type. Lambda alpha is of kind star to star, and lambda gamma is of kind star dot alpha applied to gamma. It has as an input a proper constructor alpha that takes a type and it returns a type and a constant constructor gamma. So this constructor has kind star to star to star to star. If we now apply a proper constructor and a constant constructor, we have one reduction step where we substitute every occurrence of alpha by lambda tau dot tau, and another reduction step where we substitute every gamma by sigma. And we can reduce this even further to just sigma. So better reduction, substitution, and with it also better conversion work just the same way for these type constructors. Finally, we're going to discuss derivation rules for the system lambda weak omega. Some are just variations of rules from the simply type calculus and lambda 2, while others are completely new. The variable rule, application and abstraction rules are already known from the simply type lambda calculus and lambda 2. They've only changed very slightly, as we do have the sorts in this new system which we didn't have before. Although there was a form rule in lambda 2, this form rule is quite different, and the sort rule, the weakening rule, and the conversion rule, they're all new. To get a good grasp of the system, we're going to go over all of these rules one by one. First, we need a new axiom. And in contrast to all other systems we've looked at so far, lambda weak omega only needs one axiom. Star is a box. Every proper statement of the system is provable from this little axiom. This is the case since we build everything by ourselves. We construct types, we construct terms, we even construct constructors of types, and of course also construct kinds. And this axiom is actually the construction of the very first kind. The simplest kind is inhabited by every type. So we start with a connection between levels 3 and 4. Now to get one level higher, we need to be able to state that a type variable has kind star, or a term variable has a type. For that we're going to use the variable rule. At this point, we're quite familiar with this rule, not only from the simply typed lambda calculus, which you can see here on the left, but also from lambda 2 on the right. But the rule needs to be adjusted slightly. Just as a reminder, in the simply typed lambda calculus, every type was in a fixed pre-given set. So the variable rule was the axiom of the system, saying that x of type sigma can be concluded if it is contained in the context. Already in lambda 2, we didn't have this pre-given set anymore and so we had to inspect each judgment for validity of its context. So we added the requirement of gamma being a valid context to the variable rule. Now all of this side checking isn't needed in lambda weak omega anymore. We can derive everything without any pre-checking of any contexts since we can only form valid contexts. This is also a big advantage of this system as its derivations become much more self-conclusive. If the premise is true that gamma yields a of sort s, then for every new variable x, we can add x of type or kind a to the context, and this will yield x of type or kind a. This a can be a type or a kind, since s ranges over star and box. So we basically get two rules in one. If we insert the star and box for s, the rules would look like so. In the case of star, the a would have to be a type, either a type variable or an arrow type, let's say sigma. And x would be a term variable. In the case of box, a would have to be a kind like star or star to star. And x a constructor, for example, alpha to beta. So this one rule enables us to construct constructors, constant and proper ones, and variables of a certain type. Now one might or might not wonder if the variable rules from the other two systems are included in this rule. And yes, but not quite. We're going to look at two examples to solve this. We can in fact derive that sigma is a type and x is of type sigma together yield x of type sigma. That's already half of the variable rules from the other two systems. As usual, we have to state this at the bottom and using only valid derivation rules, we have to reach axioms at the top. Using the variable rule of weak omega, with x is x and a is sigma, we can derive sigma as a type yields sigma as a star.
Since S ranges over star and box, we can basically choose which sort we want to use in the rule. Now we apply the variable rule again, with X being sigma, A being star, and we get the premise that star is box. This is, as we know, the only axiom of this system, and so the whole derivation is valid. We only need to apply the sort rule. This is all well and good, but unfortunately the rule triggers some quite strange behavior. We can't derive the following. Sigma is a type, X is of type sigma, and Y is type sigma yields X is of type sigma. Obviously, this is just the same statement as before, just with some more unnecessary information. Still, with only the variable rule, it's not derivable. We start with the statement at the bottom and we can apply the variable rule. X is X, A is sigma. Now we get the statement, sigma is a type, Y is of type sigma yields sigma is star. And once more, the variable rule gives the statement, sigma is a type, Y is of type sigma yields star is box. But here's the problem. The sort rule only applies if the context is empty. And because sigma is a type, and Y of type sigma are the context, which is an unnecessary information for this, we can't apply any rule and the derivation is not valid. This is of course a bit problematic, since the variable rules of the simply typed calculus and lambda 2 work for arbitrarily large contexts. There is, however, a very simple solution to this problem. This system introduces a new rule that allows us to weaken a statement. If it holds that gamma yields A has type B, and also that C is sort S, then we can still conclude A has type B if we add the declaration X has type C to gamma. Of course, this variable X can be a type or a term variable, and it has to be new, so not already contained in gamma. Be aware that C of sort S has to be derivable for this to hold, so C has to be a well-formed type or kind. This is the same notion as in the thinning lemma that we proved for the simply type lambda calculus. If we add more information, we can't lose any conclusions. Okay, let's get back to the example. We can now continue from this point. Remember, we couldn't apply the sort rule as in the first example because the context wasn't empty. We apply the weakening rule, and we get one premise which is exactly our axiom, so we use the sort rule to finish that branch. And the second premise, sigma as a type, yields sigma as a type, which gives us once again the axiom after applying the variable rule again. This statement is therefore derivable. So combining the variable with the weakening rule, we covered the variable rules of lambda 2 and the simply type lambda calculus. We've already seen a formation rule for lambda 2. Unfortunately, the formation rule in weak omega doesn't have the same purpose as the one from lambda 2. In lambda 2, the formation rule provided the axioms that every type variable has kind star. The formation rule here provides the construction of arbitrary arrow types and arrow kinds. If we have two well-formed A and B of type or kind S, then A to B is also well-formed, or the other way around. If we want to derive that A to B is a well-formed type in context gamma, then it's enough to show that A and B are both well-formed in the context gamma. Again, inserting star and box for S yields these two rules. We might just insert some types for A and B, like tau and sigma to alpha, and some kinds for A and B in the box formation rule, like star and star to star. The application rule stays the same as in lambda 2, although A and B can now either be both types or both be kinds for term and type application respectively. The abstraction rule changes slightly to also cover type abstraction and to work with kinds. The second premise in the abstraction rule from lambda 2 required A to B to be a type, so, instead of the lowercase s, we had the single star here. But since we now have the type abstraction as well, a to b can also be a kind. So, s needs to be able to range over star and box once more, like so. The last rule is slightly more difficult. The most important change introduced by lambda weak omega is the abstraction and better reduction on the type level. We can now apply type constructors to types to construct new types. This leads to problems when we try to assess the equality of two types. Previously, we could check type equality simply by looking at the structure of the types, so only syntactical identity. Now things get a little bit more involved. 
Take for example the case where we apply the identity function on types to a type better. This better reduces to the type better. Now intuitively we would assume that if we had some term a with the type identity function applied to better that we should be able to conclude that a has type better. But there's currently no rule that allows us to do this. To make this work we add a new rule called the conversion rule. This rule says if a has type b then a also has type b prime as long as b and b prime are better equivalent. Of course b prime needs to be well formed therefore the second premise in this rule. When talking about terms this is actually the subject reduction property. When m and n are better reducible they have the same type. Let's look at all the rules once again. The system lambda weak omega only has one axiom which provides star is a box and all statements follow from there. The variable and weakening rule work together to prove the existence of variable terms as well as variable types. The formation rule enables us to form more complex types and kinds. The application and abstraction rules prove the existence of the recursive terms and types constructed via application and abstraction. And finally, the conversion rule deals with better convertible terms and types. Before we end this video, it's worth noting that the concept of kinds that we introduced as part of the system lambda weak omega also shows up in the real world functional programming languages like Haskell. You rarely have to think about them when programming, but under the hood they're there all the time, playing a similar role to the kinds in lambda weak omega, namely the type of a type. This slide shows the type signatures of a potential implementation of lists that work with the elements of arbitrary element types. So we can have lists of integers, or lists of strings, or even lists of lists of integers. On the left is the version of the Lambda Calculus, and on the right the Haskell implementation. Let's look at the version in the Lambda Calculus first. Assume we have some type called int that we use to represent integers. Since int is just an ordinary type, it's of kind star. List on the other hand is a proper type constructor. So it takes a type, say int, and it returns a type, representing lists consisting of integers. A function length that returns the length of a list could have the following type signature. It takes a type alpha and a list with the elements of type alpha and it returns the length an int. Now the Haskell part on the right hand side looks almost the same. The type int is just a type. The type int is just a type, so it's of kind star, and in Haskell this is denoted with two colons instead of one. List is a type constructor, so it gets the kind star to star. Applying list to the type int yields just an ordinary type again, a list of integers. The type of the length function is also the same, only with a slightly simplified syntax that doesn't require us to introduce the type a beforehand as we did with the alpha in the lambda calculus. So we just write list a to int to denote that this function gets a list of certain objects of a type a and it returns an integer. If you'd like to know more about the role of kinds in Haskell, there's a link in the literature section to an introduction on Haskell's kinds. This is a video on YouTube that explores the topic in greater detail. Now you might have noticed that we can't express the type of the length function in lambda weak omega, because the pi binder that binds the type alpha only exists in lambda 2. But since the construct also uses the type constructor list, which is only possible in lambda weak omega, it can't be expressed in lambda 2 alone either. To be able to write this type, we need to combine lambda 2 and lambda weak omega into a system that supports terms depending on terms, types depending on types, and also types depending on terms. This system is called lambda omega without the attribute weak. The name omega comes from the fact that in lambda omega we allow an arbitrary length of kinds. Star is allowed as well as star to star and star to star to star and so on. Lambda omega can also be denoted by f underscore w where the f is just another symbol for lambda 2 and is called the higher order polymorphic lambda calculus. It's the extension or union of all lower order polymorphic lambda calculi. The first order polymorphic lambda calculus f1 just allows the kind star so no abstraction over types at all and thus it's just lambda 2. In the second order polymorphic lambda calculus f2, first order abstraction is allowed, so the kinds star and star to star. In the third order calculus f3, we additionally allow star to star to star, and so on. 
And if we combine all of those and allow arbitrary chains of stars, we're back at f omega. This system, lambda omega, is way more useful than lambda weak omega, and it has more computational power than lambda 2 and weak omega alone. If you're interested in these polymorphic lambda calculi, or different orders, we suggest you take a look at the literature section. There, we've gathered a few papers that cover this topic under the title Polymorphic Lambda Calculi. So, to conclude this video. In lambda weak omega, we get types depending on types acting as type constructors. To differentiate different type constructors, we introduce the concept of kinds. These kinds all have the type box. We mainly did this so we can use the box symbol in the derivation rules to denote that something should be a kind, and in preparation for the lambda cube. The introduction of kinds and the box symbol gives us two new levels besides terms and types. We can write those sort of judgment chains to establish the relationship between these levels. This system by itself has the same computational power as the simply typed lambda calculus, so it's weaker than lambda 2. But if we combine the terms depending on terms from lambda 2 with the types depending on types from lambda weak omega, we get a system called lambda omega which is more powerful than lambda 2. But lambda weak omega alone also has some advantages. Types have become much more expressive. This is very useful in a programming and in a proposition as types approach, where types are a tool to state logical propositions. When talking about type term dependencies, we covered almost all combinations. The only one missing is types depending on terms. This is going to be the main part of the last extension of the simply type lambda calculus that we want to look at. That system is called lambda p, and it's going to be analyzed in the next video. Thank you very much for watching, and see you then.